Okay. His objection is Hebrews 1 8 is quoting Psalm 45 6, and it is. And Psalm 45 is about King David, and King David is called God Elohim. Well, King David ain't Yahweh, is he? So when it's applied to Jesus, that means Jesus is being called God, similarly to David. And since David isn't Yahweh, neither is Jesus, especially when it says, this king has a God over him. You guys understand the objection? Hebrews 1.8, Jesus is called God, but it doesn't mean he's Yahweh. He doesn't mean he's God in an absolute sense. Because Hebrews 1.8 is quoting Psalm 45.6, where there it's about King David. And King David is said to be Elohim God, but he has a God over him. So David is not Yahweh, and he's not literally God. He represents God, so he acts in the place of God. And this is applied to Jesus, proving Jesus isn't Yahweh, but he's God in a lesser sense, especially when Jesus has a God over him. Okay, that's the objection, right? Why am I laughing? Here, you'll see why. Let's read Hebrews 1.8 in context, shall we? Let's read Hebrews 1.8 in context. Hebrews 1.8 to 12. Watch here. Now watch. This is why I'm laughing. I said, I can't believe this guy used this argument. I'll use Revive. Well, I can't. I'll use the I'll use New King James Version. Hebrews 1, 8 to 12. Watch here. But to the Son, he says, your throne, O God. Now, in the Greek, by the way, it's all theos. In the Greek, those of you who read Greek, it's your throne, O Theos. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Now, here's the key. Therefore, God, your God, ah, he has a God, but Yahweh doesn't have a God over him. Okay, has anointed you with the old gladness more than your companions. The companions means the human beings that he came to redeem in the context of Hebrews. All right, now, remember what he said? He said, Jesus is not God in the sense of Yahweh because he has a God over him. You know why that's ironic? Because verses 10 to 12, if you continue reading 10 to 12, the Father calls Jesus Yahweh. In the very passage that Don says, Jesus cannot be God in the sense of Yahweh. In that very passage, God goes on to call Jesus Yahweh. Here, verse 10. I mean, talk about the Lord embarrassing these heretics. Did you read on to 10 to 12? Because it goes on to saying, you, Lord. This is now the Father speaking to the Son. You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. And the heavens are the work of your hands. Pay attention, brethren. So the Father says to the Son, You are Lord, and you laid the foundation of the, of the earth at the beginning. What beginning? Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. That's you. And the heavens are the work of your hands. Hands being a metaphor for his power, his infinite power. Right? Now watch what else God says to the Son. Right? They will perish, but you... You meaning Jesus, my son, remain. They will all grow like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up because you're sustaining creation. And they will be changed, but you are the same and your years will not fail. Can you help me understand? JJ, tread lightly, I'll block you. Can you help me understand? How can Don say Hebrews 1.8 is not calling Jesus God in the sense of Yahweh when verses 10 to 12... God calls Jesus Yahweh by quoting Psalm 102, a psalm about Yahweh being the unchanging, almighty creator, sustainer of all creation. And God takes that psalm about Yahweh and ascribes it to the Son. Because I'm going to show you the context of Psalm 102, where the Father was quoting and applying it to the Son. You guys caught it? Here, let me show you the psalm that was being quoted, and I'll use World English Bible, which uses the term Yahweh, okay? Watch this. Talk about the Lord humiliating someone. Here it is. 
World English Bible because it uses the word Yahweh. Watch here. Here you go. This Psalm 102 is about who? Here it is. Psalm 102. And you're going to see what Hebrews 1, 10 and 12 was quoting. Here it is. Psalm 102. Here's the Psalm that Hebrews 1, 10 and 12 applies to Jesus. And it's the Father applying it to Jesus. Psalm 102. A prayer of the afflicted. When he is overwhelmed and pours out his complaint before Yahweh. Hear my prayer, Yahweh. Let my cry come to you. Okay. Pay attention, brethren. This psalm is a prayer to Yahweh, not a creature. Psalm 102, 12. Psalm 102, 12. Okay. But you, Yahweh, will remain forever. Psalm 102, verse 12. Your renown endures to all generations. All right. Psalm 102, 12. But you, Yahweh, will remain forever. Your renown endures to all generations. Now watch Psalm 102, 18 to 22. Watch here. Watch. This psalm is entirely directed to Yahweh, not a creature. Psalm 102, 18 to 22. Let's see if you're paying attention. Lord bless numbers for his glory. This will be written for the generation to come. A people which will be created will praise Yah. For he has looked down from the height of his sanctuary. From heaven, Yahweh saw the earth to hear the groans of the prisoner, to free those who are condemned to death, that men may declare Yahweh's name in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. When the peoples are gathered together, the kingdoms to serve Yahweh. All right. Now the verses that Hebrews 1.10 quoted. Here it is. We're going to start at 24. Watch here. This is what Hebrews 1, 10 and 12 quoted about Jesus. And I'll show you it again. Psalm 102, 24 to 27. Help me to help you guys. Stay focused, please. Psalm 102, 24 to 27. I said, my God, don't take me away in the middle of my days. Your years are throughout all generations. Of old, he's praying to his God. Of old, you laid the foundation of the earth. Sound familiar? The heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will endure. Yes, all of them will wear out like a garment. You will change them like a cloak, and they will be changed. But you are the same. Your years will have no end. Did you guys catch it? Psalm 102 is about Yahweh. It is a praise and a prayer to Yahweh, where the psalmist glorifies Yahweh of being the one who at the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, made the heavens by his hands, hands being a metaphor for his infinite power, where he will roll up creation like a garment, and they change, but he remains the same, and his years never end. And this psalm is applied to Jesus. Here it is, Hebrews 1, 10 to 12. The Father speaking to the Son. And I'm quoting World English Bible. The Father takes these words and applies it to the Son. So the Father says to the Son, And you, Lord, which in Hebrews 1.8 is the Son, so the Son who is God is the Lord that the Father is speaking to. You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. The heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you continue. They will all grow old like a garment does. You, the Lord, the Son, who is God, will roll them up like a mantle, and they will be changed. But you are the same. Your years won't fail. And the World English Bible even gives you the cross-reference. Guys, can I ask you a question? How can Don say Hebrews 1.8 is not calling Jesus God in the sense of Yahweh, when in the very context, if you read Hebrews 1.8 to 12, God the Father goes on to call Jesus Yahweh, by identifying him as the Lord of Psalm 102, who created the heavens and the earth by his own power, who sustains and changes them, and who is unlike creation, because he remains the same and his years never end, things that you can only say of Yahweh, the Father says to the Son. 
What is this guy talking about? Did we get that before I move on? Did it sink in? Isn't it funny how the Lord just exposed him? The very chapter where he says Jesus is not called God in the sense of Yahweh, in verses 10 and 12, it does that very thing. Calls Jesus Yahweh. And who calls Jesus Yahweh? The Father. So here's my challenge to young Don Stillborn. Show me where an Old Testament passage describing Yahweh as the almighty creator, sustainer of all creation, who is unchangeable by nature, who will change up creation by his power because he sustains it, but he remains the same. Such a passage can be ascribed to a creature because a creature by its very nature is part of the creation that's changing and a creature by its very nature cannot be the Lord who created heavens and the earth and sustains them. Do you guys get it? So the very chapter says Jesus is God in the sense of being Yahweh, though he's not the Father. And how amazing that Hebrews has the Father glorifying his Son, praising his Son, magnifying his Son as the God who reigns forever and as that very Yahweh who at the beginning created the heavens and the earth and sustains them. Who calls Jesus the Yahweh who at the beginning creates the heavens and the earth and sustains them? The Father does. So if the Father calls Jesus Yahweh, how dare you deny that he's Yahweh when the Father himself glorifies him as Yahweh? Do you know more than the Father does? Do you know more than the Father? You're telling me you're more sanctified, holy, and wiser than the Father Almighty because you refuse to call Jesus Yahweh when the Father himself calls, glorifies, praises, magnifies Jesus Son as Yahweh, the unchangeable, almighty, creator, sustainer of all things? You blasphemer, Bible butcher, You with me there? All right. Now, how do we answer the fact that if Jesus is Yahweh God, how could he have a God over him? Very simply. Psalm 45, which is applied to Christ in Hebrews 1, pay attention, is talking about the Messianic king, the Davidic king who rules forever and ever. Here's my question. If Jesus is the Messianic King, the heir to David's throne, if Jesus is the Messianic King, the one who inherits David's throne, could he be the heir to David's throne if he's not human? To be the heir to the throne that God gave to David's household, you got to be human, right? Okay, I know there's a delay, but that's okay. We're learning. And not only must you be human, you must be a physical descendant of David, right? Okay. And doesn't Hebrews 2, 9 to 15 say that Jesus deliberately took on flesh and blood so he can be human like us, so he can be related to us by nature? Here, Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, the next chapter. Here you go. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Here you go. So you think I'm not making it up. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Since then, the mm -hmm. children have shared in flesh and blood. He, Jesus, also himself, in the same way, partook of the same. Since the children he came to save were flesh and blood humans, he became a flesh and blood human being from the virgin. That through death, his human death, he might bring to nothing him who had the power of death, that is the devil. So by destroying physical death and rising immortal, he may destroy our fear of dying 
Because now that we know Jesus is alive and he destroyed death, we now have assurance when we die, we don't cease to exist. It's not the end of us. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us confidence not to be afraid of death because you destroyed death by rising in your flesh body immortal. Praise you, Lord. Now we don't fear death because of you. And might deliver all of them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. You see how much he loves us? In his love for us, he became flesh and died so that by his physical resurrection, being raised on the third day in that physical body, raising it up, making it immortal, destroying physical death, leaving the tomb empty, is one of the greatest proofs of the truth of Christianity. When they give us the announcement, you got six months to live, we may panic at that moment, but when we cry out to Jesus, the Holy Spirit will come upon us like a flood, filling us to overflowing, giving us peace, speaking to our hearts and in our ears. Fear not, your brother Jesus has conquered death and he's alive. And because he's alive, this is a door. You'll enter, you won't cease to live because he lives forever and he loves you and you'll be with him. Don't be afraid. Your brother Jesus, your eldest brother, the firstborn, has come to destroy your fear of death. Where am I getting this from? Hold on. So you don't think I'm making it up. Let me read Hebrews 2, 14 in context, 12 to 15. Hebrews 2, 12 to 15. So you see, I'm getting it from the text. Okay. God will give you the grace that you need when you need it. Right now, we don't need the grace not to fear death. But when death comes, I promise you, the Holy Spirit who's real and who's in us will flood you at that moment, and he will speak peace to your heart. Do not be afraid. Think of Jesus. He's alive. Death is not the end of you. Fear not, my daughter. Fear not, my son. Your Lord, who became your brother, lives. And because he lives, you will live also. Here it is. Hebrews 2, 12 to 15. Jesus will say, I declare your name to my brothers. I declare your name to my brothers. We are his brothers and sisters, we who believe. Among the congregation, I will sing your praise. Meaning in church, I will praise you, my father, with my brothers and sisters, whom I've redeemed. Again, I will put my trust in him, in my father. Again, Jesus says, behold, here I am with the children whom God has given me. Abba, here are your sons and daughters. Here are your children <clears throat> that you sent me to redeem, my brothers and sisters. And because they were flesh and blood... I became flesh and blood to be related to them, to be their next of kin. And I've redeemed them. And here are they, Abba. I bring your sons and daughters to glory. I bring them home to you. That's what it's saying. Since then, the children have shared in flesh and blood. He also, he also himself, in the same way partook of the same, that through death he might bring to nothing him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might deliver all of them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now, what does that mean practically for us? It means when it's time for you to die, the risen Lord, by his spirit, will flood you with peace. And this grace of God will overtake you, like Tim Keller. Tim Keller passed away last week. When he was asked about death, he goes, I'm excited and ready to meet Jesus. I'm excited and ready to meet Jesus. He had no fear of death. I'm ready to meet Jesus. That's what he said. Right? Because that's when the Spirit will give you the grace that you need to face death. Right now, you don't need it. You're not facing death. Right? So when death comes knocking, the voice 
of the Spirit will be whispering in your ears. Remember my words. Fear not. Fear not, precious daughter. Fear not, precious son. Your brother, <clears throat> Jesus Christ, is alive. He conquered death. He left the tomb empty to assure you this is not the end of you. You're going home to be with your brother Jesus and to appear before your father. That's the promise. So how does that relate? How does that relate to Jesus having a God? Well, the only way Jesus can fulfill the role of messianic king, the anointed king of Israel, the heir to David's throne, is that if he becomes human, not only becomes human, he must be a physical descendant of David through his blessed mother. If he becomes human and he becomes part of creation by virtue of his human nature, then the father becomes his God. What's the problem? Jeremiah 32, 27 is quite clear. Behold, I, Jehovah, Yahweh, am the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? So if God is the God of all flesh, the Son becomes flesh, flesh and blood, to become one of us, related to us by nature, next of kin, right? And the Father didn't become flesh, and Jesus became flesh to serve the Father. Why would it shock you the Father becomes his God after he becomes flesh, and he remains in the flesh, because if he's not in the flesh, he's not a physical son of David. If he's not a physical son of David, he cannot be the heir to David's throne. Where's the problem? In other words, if you derive your theology from the Bible and you let Hebrews 1 speak in context, Hebrew, Hebrews 1 affirmed Jesus is the Son of God, who is Yahweh God, who became flesh and blood, who became a man. And as a man, he's a son of David. And by becoming man, the Father becomes his God. So Hebrews 1 affirms Jesus is not the Father, right? And yet Jesus is Yahweh God, but he also became flesh and blood, Hebrews 2, 9, 18, to become a physical son of David, to reign on David's throne as his son. So he's Yahweh God, the son of the Father that becomes flesh. And as a man in his flesh, the Father's is God. That's why we get our theology. We don't want sissified Christianity. Did you understand how Hebrews 1, 8 to 12 buried their arguments? How Hebrews 1, 8 to 12 actually said the very thing that Don denied, that Jesus is God in the sense of Yahweh, but he's not just God. He's also flesh and blood, a glorified man with a glorified physical body, having a human nature, and as a man with a human nature, he has a God over him. So as the God-man, God as man, God in man, God in flesh, the Father is his God by virtue of his human nature. But as the Son of God, he's equal to the Father because the Father himself just glorified him, praised him, magnified him as Yahweh Almighty, the eternal, unchangeable creator, sustainer of all creation. This is where we get our theology from, from the Bible. We get our Trinitarian understanding from the Bible. You with me? So it's from the Bible that we conclude Jesus is the Son of God. He's not the Father. And the Father magnifies Jesus as Yahweh God Almighty the unchangeable almighty creator, sustainer of all creation, who becomes flesh and blood from the virgin, so becomes human and remains human because he raises his physical body, so he's forever united to his physical body, so he's forever united to his human nature, so he's now God in flesh, and as man, the Father's is God, so Jesus is Yahweh, the Son of Yahweh, and Yahweh the Father becomes his God, when Yahweh the Son becomes flesh. And this is all from Hebrews 1 and 2. I got this from Hebrews chapter 1 and chapter 2. Flesh and blood, the heir of David's throne, who has a physical son of David, 
fulfills the covenant with David that one of his sons will sit on the throne forever. So he's a man. And the father's is God because he's a man. But the same Hebrews 1 and 2 says, the father appoints a son to create all things, to sustain all things by his powerful word. And the father then glorifies the son as Yahweh Almighty, the unchangeable creator, sustainer of all things. What more do you want? I don't butcher the scripture or take verses out of context or focus on certain verses and ignore others. I read the Bible in context as a whole and let the whole counsel of the Bible tell me what my theology should be. Is that clear, that point? Well, what about Psalm 45? Is that about King David? I'm going to write an article, Lord willing, this week and finish it and do a session on it. Is Psalm 45 about King David? So is Psalm 45 talking about King David, which is then ultimately fulfilled in Christ. Is Psalm 45 a psalm about David being called God, reigning on God's behalf on earth, which then foreshadows Christ? No, here's where you're going to get shocked. And here's my challenge to young Don stillborn. Here's my challenge. Here's Psalm 45, World English Bible. Here's the challenge to every one of you. And Lord willing, when I finish the article, I'm going to do a session on this. Here it is, World English Bible. I'm going to show it to you on the screen. Here's the challenge. Okay, you ready? Here's the challenge. I challenge young Don. I challenge any anti-Trinitarian, I challenge any Unitarian, Jehovah Witness Muslim, to show me anywhere in the psalm, any place in the psalm, any place in the psalm that says this is about King David. Here it is. You ready? Did you click on it? Here's my challenge right now. I want every one of you to click on it. It will take you a minute. Show me where... The king of Psalm 45 is named. Show me where it says this king is David or Solomon or Hezekiah or Josiah. Show me. Nowhere in the psalm, no single place in the psalm is the king mentioned by name. So where do you get it's about David? Where do you get it's about Solomon? Where do you get it's about Hezekiah? There's not a single place in that psalm that tells you that the psalmist is talking about David or Solomon or Hezekiah. None. Zero. Nada. Zip. That's the gift of the Holy Spirit. God us up. All glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. Forgive me this gift of recall me, perfected in me that I use it to glorify the Lord. Do you know why? Because the psalm is not about any Davidic king. It's about Messiah. God inspired the psalmist to compose the psalm in such a way that it can only apply to Christ and no one else. Did you know that? And in my upcoming article and session, I'm going to prove to you this psalm is the Father speaking. Did you know that? This psalm is the Father speaking. I'm going to show in an upcoming article session, Psalm 45 is the Father speaking. The Father is inspiring the psalmist and using the psalmist as his mouthpiece. So it's not the human writer speaking. It's the Father speaking and the human writer writing down the words of the Father. You want me to give you some nuggets of my upcoming session and article to prove it? From verse 1 all the way to 17. Other translations will end at 18. It's the Father speaking. So the human writer is being inspired by the Father to write down the words of the Father, the words the Father says to the Son. It's not the words of a human writer inspired by the Spirit speaking of either David or Solomon Hezekiah. It's the Father's words to the Son, which the human writer is inspired to write down. Just like there are certain Old Testament passages where Jesus speaking, like Isaiah 49, 
Isaiah 50, Isaiah 61. And Jesus is speaking through the human writer as his mouthpiece or Psalm 22. And other places, it's the Holy Spirit speaking through the human writer. Here, it's the Father's words that the human writer is recording by inspiration. It's not the human writer praising David or Solomon by inspiration. It's the Father speaking to the Son, about the Son, directly to the Son and no one else, that the writer is writing down, anticipating the incarnation. Do you want me to give you an example? Do you want me to show you how the church fathers use Psalm 45 to prove the begetting of the Son? Here, from my article. It's all coming in my article this week and upcoming session. Pray I finish it this week. Did you know that Psalm 44, verses 1 to 3, which is the numbering of the Psalm, the Greek version, was cited by the church fathers as proof of the begetting of the Son, of the Logos of the Word? Did you know that? Here, let me prove it to you. Here's Psalm 45, 2. This is a tree of life version because it accurately captures the Hebrew. Watch this. This is the passage the fathers quoted. Get ready to be blown away because I alluded to this in previous sessions, but I'm going to do an entire session on this. My heart is stirred with a good word. Ah, Rachash Libbi Dabar Tob. My heart has stirred up a good word. Pay attention. My heart has stirred up a good word. It's stirring up from my heart. This word is bubbling up. Out of my heart. Hmm. I speak my verses to the king. See? I am speaking to the king. My tongue is the pen of a skillful writer. Notice the speaker is saying, my tongue is like a writer who uses a pen. So he's not writing these words down. He's speaking these words like a writer who writes them. You're making the connection? Are you making the connection? Now, why is that statement, my heart is stirred with a good word, literally, rachash libbi dabar tob. My heart is stirring up, bubbling up with a good word. Why is that important? Let me show you how the church fathers explained it on the basis of the Greek translation of this passage. Here is the English translation of the Greek. If you guys, you Greek speakers, go to Psalm 44. See what the Greek says, and I'm going to show it to you. I'm not copying pasting from my article. It's not done yet. I'm not done yet. I'm going to show it to you. And I'm going to prove to you it cannot refer to any mere human Davidic king. It has to be about the God-man. That's why no king is named because it's not about a king of the past. It's all about Jesus. Here it is. Get ready to be blown away. Here is the English translation of the Greek. And I'll show you church fathers citing this about the eternal begetting of the Son. Tippy Bear, are you ready? Here you go. Here's the English translation of the Greek, Psalm 44, verse 1 and 2. For the end, for alternate strains by the sons of Korah, for instruction, a song concerning the beloved. Wait, this song is about the beloved to agape to... Beloved, one of the names of Jesus in New Testament, I'll show you. My heart has uttered a good word. Ek iriochatu i kardiamu logon agathon. My heart has stirred up the logos. That is good. The good logos has sprung forth from my heart. The logos, my beloved. Logon is the accusative of Logos. From my heart sprung forth the good word, the good Logos. And this is the Logos who is my beloved. Let me show you the church fathers using this. Watch here. It's going to come in my upcoming article. I'm going to prove to you it cannot refer to any mere human king. I'm going to show you that Jesus is called the Logos and beloved Agapitas in the New Testament written in Greek. But let me first show you the fathers, all right? Tertullian, 
Tertullian, it's a lengthy quote, so I'm just going to quote the relevant part, against Praxius, who was a modalist heretic that Tertullian refuted. And I'm going to quote Cyprian. Look what they quote, brethren. Tertullian, what does he quote to prove that in the Old Testament, there is more than one divine person, there are at least two, and that Jesus is the eternally begotten Son of God. What does he quote? Tertullian against Praxius, who's a modalist heretic, who thought the Father is Jesus. Chapter 7, folks, look what he quotes. And here I click, click on the link. You can read online. But it's too long, but I'm just going to quote the relevant part. Okay, here you go. Where is it? Here you go. Look at all the passages he quotes, guys. Watch here. Here you go. Tertullian, what do you quote to prove the Son is eternally generating Word of God, even in the Old Testament? So there are two distinct persons already in the Old Testament, destroying modalism. Quote, then therefore does the Word also himself assume his own form and glorious garb, his own sound and vocal utterance, when God says, let there be light. There, Tertullian says, Genesis 1-3, is when Jesus, the Word, sprung forth out of God. He was then generated out of God. So he's always resided in God. He's uncreated and then sprung forth. Let there be light. That's when God summoned the word to come out of him. Genesis 1-3. This is the word when he proceeds forth from God. Formed by him first to devise and think out all things in the name of wisdom. Now notice what else he quotes. Proverbs 8-22. The Lord created or formed me as the beginning of his ways. Now, notice what else he quotes. Then afterward, begotten to carry all into effect. When he prepared the heaven, I was present with him. Quoting Proverbs 8. Thus does he make him equal to him, for, for, for by proceeding from himself. So the word wasn't created, ex nihilo. The word eternally, inseparably was with God, within God, and came forth from God. Proceeding from himself, okay, he became his first begotten because begotten before all things and his only begotten also because alone begotten of God. Now watch what he quotes, Psalm 44, 2. Anyway, peculiar to himself from the womb of his own heart, even as the father himself testifies, my heart, says he, has emitted my most excellent word. Did you guys catch it? The guys catching? According to Tertullian, Psalm 44, 2 is the Father speaking. Moab, everyone else. Do you understand that the church fathers took the words of Psalm 44 as God, the Father speaking? So when Psalm 44, 2 says, my heart, has emitted a good word. That's the Father speaking of the word that resided within him, being begotten out of his bosom, out of his heart. Oh, we're almost done with this. All right, everyone caught it? The archive, everyone else? Now, who else quotes Psalm 44 to? Cyprian. Cyprian. Here it is. Cyprian quotes Psalm 44 too about the generation of the Son. Let me get you the link. It's in my article coming up, but I'll give you the link online. This too is too long for me to quote. I'm going to quote snippets. It's from Cyprian's Treatise 12, Book 2. And here it is. You can read it online. I'll just give you the link from my article. You can read it online. Okay. You guys getting blown away with the exegesis of the church fathers? What they saw in scripture that sadly we don't see today unless we read them. And then they illuminate you to say, oh, so Psalm 45 is the father speaking. No wonder there is no human king mentioned by name because it's not about any mere human king. It's about the divine king who became flesh. It's entirely about Jesus. Here it is. Here it is. Chapter 3. Look what he quotes. Chapter 3. Look what he quotes. To prove that the father generated the son. So now look what he quotes. 
quote Cyprian that the same Christ is the Word of God in the 44th Psalm. Because remember, he's reading the Latin version of the Greek version and Psalm 45. In the Latin Greek is Psalm 44. In the 44th Psalm, my heart has breathed out a good word. I tell my works to the king. Bam! Is this blowing you guys away? The early church fathers took Psalm 45 as the father speaking to the king, his son. And speaking of the king, the son, proceeding, emitting out of the father's heart. Because the son, the king, is his word dwelling in his heart who came forth. So they took it as the father speaking to the son. And affirming that the son's origin is within the father, in the heart of the father, in the bosom of the father, inseparably and eternally, who the father then stirred up out of his bosom and brought him forth without severing from the father. Did the link work when you admit it, the semicolon at the end? Because i got to change it in my article. We're almost done. Be patient with me. Because then we're done with this objection. And I want to make a challenge to him. Let me change the link. One second. Okay, now it works. So you got the link now? Now I fixed it in my article. Okay. Now, there's another father that I cite. Let me see. Let me just... Uh, now, Tertullian isn't a father. Tertullian is a church writer. He's not a father. Cyprian is. Novation. Novatian. In chapter 13, on his treatise concerning the Trinity. And this is the final quote. This will be all in my upcoming article. See what I do, guys? Behind the scenes, I'm researching, writing, publishing posts for new sessions and new articles to equip you, empower you by the Holy Spirit. So now watch. Novation 2. What does he quote? Here is chapter 13. Okay. Here you go. That the same truth is proved from the sacred writings of the New Covenant. Jesus is the eternally begotten Son of the Father. He's not the Father because Novation is refuting another modal heretic. He is the eternal Son of the Father, already existed, distinct from the Father, before creation. Here you go. Chapter 13, that the same truth is proved from the sacred writing of the New Covenant, and thus also John, describing the nativity, meaning the birth of Christ, says, The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. For moreover, His name is called the Word of God, Revelation 19, 13, and not without reason. Now watch what he quotes. My heart has emitted a good word. That's Psalm 44, 2. Psalm 45, 2 in the Hebrew. Which word he subsequently calls by the name of the king, inferentially, I will tell my works to the king. How many of you are blown away that the church writers, such as Tertullian, and the church father, Cyprian, saw Psalm 45, which in their version was Psalm 44, as the father speaking directly to the son. So it's not a psalm of any mere human king. It's the father's praise of the son in anticipation of him becoming flesh. And they took verse 2 as the father referring to the good word residing in his bosom, emitting out of him the begetting of the son. So do you remember what Psalm 44, 1 and 2 says? That this psalm is addressed to the beloved and that the heart of the speaker is stirred up with a good word that he emits from himself and he speaks to the king? Well, does the New Testament call Jesus the beloved who's in the heart of the Father? Can I show you that? You guys ready for that? What Psalm 45, 1 and 2, Psalm 44, 1 and 2 in the Greek says, this is to the beloved, agapitas, the word that is stirred up within the heart of the speaker and emitted out of his heart, 
that word that is good, right? Speaking to the king, all of those descriptions are applied to Christ. Let me show it to you. It's going to come in my article, but let me give you here. Is Jesus called Agapitas, the beloved? Yes. Is Jesus said to be in the heart of the Father? Yes. Is Jesus the Word? Yeah. John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. John 1, 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 1 John 1, 1. The Word of life. Revelation 19, 13. Revelation 19, 13. <clears throat> his name is called the Word of God. Well, is he... The beloved, <coughs> Agapitas. And does he reside in the bosom of the Father? Yep, here you go. Let me show it to you. John 1.18. John 1.18. Here you go. Here you go, brethren. John 1.18. You ready? It's all going to be in my article. One second, Tippy. You can come on my stream right in a minute. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. O on istun kolpon tu patrus. He has explained him. So Jesus, the Word, the Son, is continuously, because there, O on, the being, the existing one, is present active. It's the present participle. Of Amy, present partis participle, the participial form of Amy, the one who is dwelling in the bosom, Kolpon of the Father. Here's another rendering. Here's another rendering. Okay. Here is the voice, so you can see it. Okay. Here's another rendering. Then I'm going to show you where he's called the beloved. And then let me give you another line of evidence that Psalm 45 cannot be speaking of any mere human king. And then Tippy can call it. God unseen until now is revealed in the voice, God's only son, straight from the father's heart. Is he called the beloved though? Hold on, Sam. Psalm 44, 1 and 2 says that this is directed to the beloved, right? To the king. The good word that is emitted from the speaker's heart. All right, well, is Jesus called the beloved? Here you go. Colossians 1.13. Not going to give you all of them, just a few. More will come in my upcoming session and article. And this is all from my article. I haven't finished it yet. Colossians 1.13. For he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Tu, viu, tes, agapes. Agapes, there it is, autu. There's the word, agapitas, agapes. He is the son of his love, his beloved. So Jesus is the beloved, the good word, who's in the bosom, heart of the Father, and he is the king, who is the God that reigns forever. One more verse, and then we're going to wrap it up from Psalm 45, to show you it cannot refer, it cannot refer, refer to a mere human king psalm 45 impossible ephesians 1 6 are you guys bored or you're enjoying this ephesians 1 6 to the praise of the glory of his unmerited favor grace which he god the father freely bestowed upon us in the beloved one of the names of jesus is he's the beloved to a Gape menou, menou, manao, e gape manao, and then John three thirty five. The Father loves the Son. John seventeen twenty four. Father, you've loved me from before the creation of the world. Mark one eleven. This is my Son, whom I love, with whom I'm well pleased. Mark nine seven. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Mark 9, 7. Mark 1, 11. John 3, 35. John 17, 24. So did you catch it? Jesus is the beloved. Jesus is 
the word of God, who is good. John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd, right? And Jesus is dwelling in the heart of the Father. And Psalm 45 is directed to the beloved, to the king. And the one being addressed is the good word that is emitted from the heart of the speaker. And that speaker is the Father, according to Hebrews. Now watch. Final evidence that Psalm 45 cannot be about a mere human king. Are you ready? Are you ready? So now we just obliterated, destroyed Don's butchering of Hebrews 1.8 and Psalm 45. It's over for the anti-Trinitarians. If you learn these arguments... And ask the Holy Spirit to help you remember them and then accurately present them. You have annihilated these anti-Trinitarians, whether Joe's witnesses, Unitarians, Hebrew Israelites. Ender Elohim, good to see you, brother. We missed you. Final line of evidence that Psalm 45 is not about any mere human king. Don't let anyone deceive you. If they say it's about Solomon, show me. David, show me. And how can it be about Solomon and David when notice what it says about him? Psalm 45, 17, which in some translation will be Psalm 45, 18. Look what it says. Two things are said about this king that cannot be true of any mere human king. Here you go. Psalm 45, 17 from the New King James Version. Psalm 45, 17. This is the psalmist speaking, proving it's God speaking. The psalmist is writing down the words of God. It's God speaking. It's his speech that the writer is recording. How do I know? Look, who's saying this? It's not about the king, but who's saying this? I will make your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, the people shall praise you forever and ever. Who could this be who says, I'm going to cause all generations to remember you, the king, and they will praise you forever and ever? Are you telling me God is going to cause people to praise and glorify a mere human king forever and ever? And then the knockout, watch this one. You thought that was amazing. Psalm 45, 11. Now, in some translations, it's going to be verse 12. Watch this. This is going to blow you away. And Catholic biblicists, remember this against the anti-Unitarians. Watch here. Psalm 45, 11. 12 in some versions. This one, Kiri this is a knockout. So the king, talking about the queen. It's not about the queen, which is the church, the bride of Christ, and the blessed mother. I'll prove that in an upcoming session. Right now, I'm just showing you it cannot be about a mere human king. So the king will greatly desire your beauty because he is your Lord. Adonai ik. He is your Adonai, Catholic Biblicist. Worship him. Yishtichava, Shacha. In Greek, it's proskenio. Queen, he is your Adonai, so worship him. Did you know the word Adonaiic, this word? Ik means your, your Adonai, Adonaiic. This word is only used one other time. The word Adonai is only used twice in the entire Old Testament. Once for this king, another time for Jehovah. In Isaiah 51, 22. Here, let me show you. Adonai is only used twice. Twice. Once for the king and the other time for Jehovah God Almighty. Isaiah 51, 22. Here it is. Isaiah 51, 22. I'm not making it up. Thus says your Lord, Adonai, the same word, Jehovah and your God. Now notice here, Jehovah is said to be our Elohim and our Adonai. And yet the king in Psalm 45, he's called Elohim, who rules forever, and he's called Adonai. In fact, the word Adonaiic is used of the king and of Jehovah and no one else in the entire Bible. Thus says Adonaiic, 
a word only used for Jehovah and the king of Psalm 45, 11. The Lord, meaning Jehovah, your God, your Elohim. And yet, the king is said to be Elohim. No, my voice is good. Who pleads the cause of his people. See, I have taken out of your hand the cup of trembling, the dregs of the cup of my fury. You shall no longer drink it. And then you remember what Psalm 45, 6 says? Your throne, Elohim, is forever and ever. The king's throne is forever and ever. All right, now watch this. Watch this. Psalm 45, 6. We're going to wrap it up. We're done. Your throne, God, Elohim, is forever and ever. All right, so the king's throne is forever. So he is the God, the Elohim, who rules forever. But hold on. Lamentations 5.19. Lamentations 5.19. Watch this. Tell me if this sounds familiar. The king is called Elohim, whose throne endures forever. But wait. In Lamentations 5.19, and we're done. You, Jehovah, O Lord, Yahweh, remain forever. Your throne from generation to generation. So like Jehovah... The king is called Elohim, God. And like Jehovah, his rule, his throne endures forever and ever. Like Jehovah, he's called Adonai, your Adonai, my Adonai, our Adonai. And the word Adonai is only used of the king of Jehovah. And like Jehovah, he'll be praised by all generations and all nations forever and ever. And this is the one. That Jehovah calls his beloved, addressing his words to him, the king, which the fathers understood to be that good word emitted out of God's heart. We're done.